Welcome to the Ashes into Beauty podcast with your host, Stephanie Marie Laswell, Divorce Concierge at The Divorce Life. Hello, listeners. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am here with my good friend, Erica, with Gateway Mortgage. And we are kind of like peas in a pod. We're both Pisces. <laughs> <laughs> I find the houses and she lends on them. And we have a passion for serving divorcing homeowners because we have been through some sticky situations with homeowners. And unfortunately, a lot of times they're surprised about what is happening with their divorcing home. And so we love to help them and give them a little extra love as they're going through that and make sure that they're educated along the way. So Erica is going to share with us a couple of things today about um, what exactly is a certified divorce lending professional. You got it. Awesome. (laughs) Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, So a few years ago, I decided to invest in a course from the Divorce Lending Association Association. So basically, I committed to taking this course and also ongoing education where we really look at the short term and long term goals of someone going through a divorce. It's so many different moving parts Mm. um, that I really wanted to focus on how to help clients because I've been doing this for 15 years now. And I saw so many times where the decree was finalized and I just the buyers or borrowers did not fit within the guideline boxes mm-hmm. because of how the you know decree was set up. So my goal was really to help people in those very beginning stages to see what the possibilities would be of maybe keeping the home or what would it look like to purchase a home mm-hmm. after the divorce is finalized. Yeah. So so it sounds like they were surprised maybe or they didn't realize oh, this is what it's going to take for me able to either keep my home or purchase a new home. And so you're kind of educating them prior to mediation. Is that right? Exactly. Because attorneys and judges, they don't necessarily know mortgage lending guidelines. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge gray area where, you know, let's say in a situation where someone's supposed to refinance a home to keep it, but if they don't qualify We should have found that out earlier Mm -hmm. in the situation before the decree is finalized because then they can't carry through with a legal order. Right. Right. And then that puts them in a really tough bind. Exactly. They think that they've won and, oh, I get to keep the home. It's only to find out later that the timeline is coming due on their decree to have it refinanced and they don't qualify. And what would be the reasons why somebody wouldn't qualify? Could be so many things. Uh, One is credit, like if the credit scores aren't there. I find sometimes, you know, if one spouse is, you know, the primary one that deals with financial things, maybe another spouse has no clue what's going on with their credit. So I always advise people to go to annualcreditreport.com. It's free. You can pull all three credit bureaus once a year. And not necessarily focus on the credit scores. What you're really trying to find out is what's reporting on your credit and how it's reporting. Are there late pays? Are the collections, past dues, things that you don't know about um, so that you're not surprised when mm-hmm. I go to actually pull a credit report and there's a lot of stuff on there that you had no idea about. Right. So credit, that's one big factor. Another one is income. And, you know, that's that's a huge thing, especially if one spouse had been the primary caretaker, mm-hmm. homemaker um, and hasn't been working, mm-hmm. then where are we deriving the income? And there's just so many different nuances with how um, alimony and child support can be counted as qualifying income. So those, I would say, are the two biggest ones. Um, the other is what sort of equity is actually in the home. Mm-hmm. Because you know as well as I know, Mm -hmm. whenever um, maybe one spouse is keeping that home and say they've been in that residence for 5, 10, 15 years, obviously there's equity built up in that Mm -hmm. home. So the departing spouse may want some of that cash equity. Right. How how do they get that? You Mm -hmm. know, how what is the setup of that? And sometimes, you know, the loan amount may be too high for that one spouse who's keeping the home to be able to qualify for it Mm -hmm. based on their income. So 
you know, just because the judge says, hey, you know, you have to pay so and so $80,000, does that actually work? Right. And is the equity there? Yeah. And, you know, that's where obviously you come in to be able to do a comparable comparable market analysis Mm -hmm. to even get a baseline of what Mm -hmm. sort of equity is in the home. Right. And what the property is like. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. What is the condition of the home? That is something that's huge, um, especially with divorcing families, because we tend to see that whenever there are struggles within the household, the house up keeping the house in prime condition for to be sellable on the market often slips. And so that is an important thing to take into account, not just what do the numbers say, but actually going and looking at the property. And sometimes we would even want to call in um, an inspector to do an inspection or an appraiser to come in and look at the home and actually give us like more um, details on what the value is. That way, you know, we can take that to a judge as we've got a lot of, you know, discovery here that we can present to the judge in making sure that that number is accurate as possible. And there aren't any surprises. <laughs> that's right. And that's the unfortunate piece is that, you know, sometimes people like ourselves are not involved on that divorce mm-hmm. team. It's just strictly the attorneys, mm-hmm. the judges, which is fine. But you do also need that extra set of eyes yeah. to really you know, present good final numbers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just going back to the condition of the home, you know, that's a huge piece because that can certainly affect the value. Yeah. You know, just because you bought the home for X amount doesn't necessarily mean it's worth that. Of course, you know, right now everyone has equity in their homes, Mm -hmm. it seems, just with appreciation going Mm -hmm. up so much over the past couple of years. But it can still affect things, you know, if the home isn't in, you know, good shape. So, right. Well, yeah, and if you're set on wanting to keep the home, you don't want any surprises. You don't want to find out, you know, a couple of months later that, you know, the AC has gone out or there's been a huge leak and you've got to dig up pipes and, you know, <laughs> get to the city main. Like, that's very pricey and expensive. So having that inspector come in and ca- catch anything like that is, like, a huge, huge value. You know, like, it's worth spending that $150, $200 to make sure you know exactly what risk you might be taking on if you want to keep the home. So exactly. Definitely reach out to lender, realtor, make sure that you know what you're asking for. <laughs> um, not just on an emotional level, but, you know, actually with the asset that you're asking to, to keep. Um, what are some other things that people might need to be aware of if they're wanting to keep the home or, um, and they don't want to give it up. <laughs> like, what do they need to be aware of? I would say, you know, reaching out to myself, you know, getting a pre-qualification done just to mm-hmm. see where they are. It's, you know, it doesn't, um, you're not out of pocket. It's just the amount of time to <clears throat> submit your application. Let me look through things and see what we're really looking at. Um The big thing is if the income piece of it is going to be really up in the air, like, you know, we could be looking at child support or alimony. Mm -hmm. There's really specific time factors of whether or not that income can truly be used to qualify. Mm -hmm. One of those things is that we have to see at least a three-year continuance from the time the loan closes. So let's say you're receiving child support and the children are 14, 15, and 17, What you're going to be receiving in child support, you know, you won't necessarily be able to use all of that income Mm -hmm. to qualify. Another piece of it is that that income needs to be consistent. So, you know, let's say, for instance, there is a legal separation agreement. Mm -hmm. And in that agreement, you're getting $1,000 a month. And you start receiving that consistently. But let's say after the divorce is finalized, you get a check for, you know, 1800 because it's, you know, trying to cover partial for the next month. It makes that income no longer consistent. Wow. Yes. And that is a huge thing that, you know, whatever is laid out in the legal separation agreement or the divorce decree, if it's involving any sort of income, it really needs to be done exactly how mm-hmm. stated. Yeah. Otherwise, we could have issues, you know, with qualifying. That's crazy. Like, that's a huge 
I can see that being a huge problem for a lot of people to not be able to use that as income to qualify. Exactly. And, um, that's just a new rule, right? That just came out. So it has gotten more strict. Oh, okay. It's always been that, you know, the income needs to be consistent, but mm -hmm. variances like that, <clears throat> if it's being, a, you know, paid ahead one month and then lower the next month, they no longer consider that consistent. Yeah. There are other loan programs that are maybe a little bit more lenient mm -hmm. as far as being able to average the income. But if it's new and recent income, that's where we yeah. run into issues. Yeah. So if you've only been receiving it for six months, there's really not a whole lot to go back mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that people need to be aware of is that let's say you're the one who's departing the home mm -hmm. and the other spouse is the one who's retaining that residence. They've been awarded the property. They've been awarded the mortgage debt. In some instances, that mortgage debt, if you are on that mortgage and we do not have a history of that other spouse paying that mm -hmm. mortgage, or let's say you're still on the mortgage, but they've had a 30 day late payment then we may have to count that against you, that debt. So that can completely change mm -hmm. what you may be able to qualify for. Mm -hmm. So there are just so many different factors that come into play that you really need to be able to look at the whole picture, right. you know, mm -hmm. before it's all finalized. Because, yes, sometimes we can figure out a way to fit things in a box. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you just can't. The yeah. timing isn't correct, right? you know to move forward. Yeah. So when is the best time for somebody to come and talk to you if they're wanting to keep the house and they know that they're about to go through a divorce? I would say, you know, really in the beginning stages of when you start speaking to an attorney, mm -hmm. you know, you'll be discussing that, yes, I do want to keep the home and, you know, they'll consider certain parameters, but they're not going to look at the actual mortgage guidelines. So I would say, you know, right when you start speaking to an attorney mm -hmm. would be a good time. Yeah. That way you can go to it educated and eyes wide open and know exactly what you're, or at least close to exactly what you're going to be getting in the house, not only the house, but how to prepare for it financially and make sure that you've got all your bases covered and there aren't any surprises later down the road. And that's really the most unfortunate part of it is that if you just really don't know and you kind of go into it blindly, which mm -hmm. I completely understand your whole life is shifting and, yeah. you know, it's kind of a tornado of mm -hmm. all different kinds of things. But the thing that you can really do to set yourself up for success after the fact is really making sure that you know what's going on with your credit, mm -hmm. you know what the anticipated income is going to look like. And, you know, in talking to you, just looking at the budget, mm -hmm. what is a solid budget? Because, yeah. You know, on paper, a housing payment may look fine, but does that really fit into your budget mm -hmm. post-divorce? Right. And it's sounding like what you're saying is um, with some of those restrictions and guidelines on making sure that money is coming in consistently, it almost sounds like it's better to not even count on it because you can't count on what the other party is going to do if you're the, on the receiving end of that income. So just to put in a little pad and make sure that you're safe – to go ahead and just like not even count on that. Is that what you recommend to people? If that's feasible, if there's, mm -hmm. you know, you have an, another source of income, like, you know, working. Um, but yeah, that's if you can get approved without counting on that, because mm -hmm. I've seen so many times where something slips up and, you know, the child support payment comes in late or alimony yeah. or something like that. Um and even on the, you know, reverse side of that, there are so many things up in the air. But if you're the one who's departing the home um, and let's say, you know, you're obligated on the child support, the mortgage, whatever, you may not be able to qualify to buy a new home. Right. And obviously, if there are children involved, both parties want to have a sound, safe environment mm -hmm. for the children. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So it is sometimes difficult to divide all of that and still be able to sustain, mm -hmm. you know, the previous life. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I would say most of the time it's next to impossible to sustain <laughs> the um, life that you're used to um, 
as you're going through a divorce for a period, not exactly. forever. Right. It's just a period of time that things might look a little bit different. And um, absolutely going into this with all the education you can get um, ahead of time is going to help you with maybe some extra heartache down the road and some surprises that are not fun to deal with. <laughs> exactly. I feel like it's so much harder to fix things after the fact. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been in situations with clients where, you know, ultimately it may not be the best option for one party right. to keep the home. Right. And they end up selling. That's great. You know, everyone is getting the equity, you know, from mm -hmm. the sale of the home. But then what do we do after the fact? Right. <laughs> you know, right. were there issues with credit, you know, mm -hmm. during the marriage or even during the process of divorce? Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, things slip through the cracks. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I recommend having that credit report in hand so that you know what's going on and, you know, really monitoring your credit. Mm hmm. That's another huge yeah. thing. Yeah. Monitoring your credit and insurance. Yes. That's a whole nother topic, but we'll have to have another expert <laughs> on for that one. <laughs> yes. That is not my expertise, <laughs> but you know, it, the financial side of it, there are just so many things that come into play that, you know, sometimes I feel like when I'm talking to clients, they don't realize how much things change mm -hmm. in the lending side of it. Guidelines change constantly. Yeah. And especially post-COVID, we had so many different guideline changes. Mm -hmm. And something that would have worked, you know, a few years ago may not necessarily work right. today. Yeah. And so you really want to be working with someone that understands the guidelines, how the changes affect, mm -hmm. you know, certain borrowers. Um, you know, if anyone had... A big thing, obviously, during COVID were um, layoffs, furloughs, mm -hmm. things like that. So <clears throat> income that may have been consistent for years and then the past few years right. fluctuated greatly. That's another thing to mm -hmm. consider that yeah. could come into play. Right. Yeah. So many things here. There really are. <laughs> <laughs> so many things to uncover on the financial side and then just taking over the house to make sure that you're not keeping a lemon. <laughs> True. And that just could pour or take out some of your alimony or some of the money that you've been given as you're splitting assets. You don't want to pour it all into a house that just needs to be fixed, right? Right, that you can't yeah. live in and sustain. Maintain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and maintain. Yeah. So um, thank you so much for being here. If people want to contact you, what's the best way to do that? You can reach me via my cell. I've always got it on me. Of course, not right now because we are in the middle of recording. Um, but yes, uh, anyone can reach out to me. 405-410-2342 uh, is my direct line. Um, you can also check out my website, which is just my name, ericatumchuk.com. You might need to spell your last name for everyone. <laughs> yes, I probably should. It's E R I C A T Y M. CHUK.com. I think I've known you for, I don't know, seven years, and I still <laughs> don't know how to spell your last name or pronounce it correctly, to be honest. I mean, you know, it's one of those weird ones. So, but if you Google me, there are not really too many Tim Chucks that yeah. are in lending. So, if you can figure out how to spell my last name, we're all set. That's awesome. Well, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for caring about the divorce community and wanting to make sure that they are well educated before they go into wanting to keep the house. Um, until next time, thanks for tuning in, listeners. For more information on services or divorce resources provided by The Divorce Life, you can follow me on Facebook or Instagram or find us at www.thedivorcelife.com. Thank you for tuning in and listening, and a big thanks to my producer, Jazz, at the Possibilities Podcast Center.